Hey everybody, it's Vanessa the Crafty Gemini and welcome to Whip Wednesday episode number 84. Whip Wednesday is a live weekly show where I come on and I answer some pre-submitted questions for you. So if this is your first time tuning in, welcome to our live show. If you are a returning viewer, Welcome back. I'm going to pop into the chat real quick and make sure that y'all can see me and hear me. So if you can, let me know by chatting in the comments, whether on Facebook or on YouTube, where you are tuning in from. I'm coming to y'all from my home crafting studio here in North Central Florida, where it was a chilly, what, 39, 40 something this morning? Um, itching to get my plants in the garden, but the temperatures were like 90s last week and now they're high 30s. So hopefully this is it for frost and stuff for us here and we can get the gardening party started. Let me check and see, great. Hi Kelly, Kelly says she can see me and hear me. Hey Marilyn, tuning in from Melbourne. Hey Margie, tuning in from Wisconsin. Deborah's in the house from Port St. Lucie. I saw someone earlier said that this was their first time catching us uh, live, so welcome to you out there. I have a couple of questions that were pre-submitted. Now, for you to submit a question to be considered on a future episode of Whip Wednesday, there is a link to a Google document that you can enter your question there. And my team and I review it, and that's kind of where we pick questions from. We categorize them by different topics like sewing, quilting, thread, zippers, handbags, stuff like that. So any of those types of questions that I do content on, feel free to submit them there. And then, awesome, everyone can see me and hear me clearly, so let's go ahead and get started. Now, the first question I have is from Nancy, and Nancy says, I want to switch from my inexpensive mechanical brother with a gazillion purchased feet, she says, so that's her sewing machine, to a computerized machine. She says a digital machine. I'm a beginner. Does the compact Juki go through denim, etc.? I don't need it to travel. Or is there a different digital machine that I should consider? So the question that she's asking, or the machine that she's asking about, is my Juki LB5020, which if you've watched any episodes of Whip Wednesday in the last several years, you've seen me using this little machine. I say a lot that it's a good travel machine because most of us have our workhorse machine that uh -huh. we tend to use, right? Oftentimes, if you've been sewing for a long time or you do it to sell stuff or you do a lot of different types of sewing crafts, then you probably have, you know, a higher end fancy machine. But this one, I always talk about it being a workhorse because for me, I use it on my table here when I film these live videos for you. So it needs to be light enough for me to be able to lift it, move it out of the way, change the shot, you know, iron, press some fabric, bring it back in, stitch a seam and things like that. And so y'all know that I do classes on all different types of projects from garment sewing to quilting to handbag making. And we use a variety of fabrics as well. And so uh, Nancy's asking here about possibly considering this machine. Now this is again the Juki LB5020. We do sell it in our online shop. I think someone just bought one right before we went live. So there may be three or four of these left. And you know, usually they take a long time to come back into stock because of all the shipment issues and all that kind of stuff still going on. But I'm gonna show you something on this machine because she's asking about denim to show you. So I have an 8012 universal needle here. This is not necessarily the needle that you should have in here if you're gonna sew denim, but I just wanna show you on this small machine, when I say it's a workhorse, it's a workhorse. Now, I would not substitute this, you know, sub $400 machine for say an industrial or a semi-industrial machine. So if you're someone who sews a lot of like actual leather or really thick vinyls and you know, these specialty fabrics that are super thick, if you're gonna be making a ton like to sell, this is probably not the, the machine. Obviously you wanna get something more heavy duty, but I always say it's a good travel machine, it's great for retreats, but it is also the number one machine that I recommend for beginners who don't exactly know where they wanna take their sewing. So maybe you made a little zippered pouch, but maybe now you wanna try quilting. You can do both on this machine. Say you started off with bags or quilting and now you're thinking, hey, I might wanna start making clothes with stretchy fabrics. Can this machine help me with that too? And it can, because I have sewn here live on these videos with y'all over the past two and a half, three years, all of those things, because I sew all of those things, and so I've used this machine. So here I have some stretch denim that I actually made some of my jeans out of, and this fabric is kind of dark. Let's see, what's Tamara saying there? She says, I love that Juki for everything, quilting, bags, garments, and travel. So see, Tamara's one that purchased this machine from us as her travel and retreat machine, but see, she's also, or she also dabbles in all the crafts like I do, and so she's been able to also use it to make all the different things. 
piecing. You can even do straight line quilting. I've done free motion quilting on this. Speaking of which, we do also carry the extension table for it. It's not huge, but it does extend. You can put the legs down, remove the little accessory bin, and then this will give you an extra bit of space. And these took forever to get back in stock. So if you've purchased one of these machines from us and you were waiting on the extension tables, you can head on over to our shop, craftygemini.com slash shop, and that uh, the extension tables are back in stock, okay? So y'all can grab those there. Now, the denim. Let me see if I can lighten this up a bit. It's a dark navy blue denim, so it's just going to be dark, okay? But I have made myself a pair of jeans before out of, these, out of this stretch denim, and um, I had some scraps left. So I went ahead and grabbed it. It's, I would probably say it's about a... I want to say maybe seven ounce, eight ounce denim. It's not super, super lightweight. I've used really lightweight denims before for backings of picnic quilts. So I usually would buy the denim. I think it was like a four ounce denim. I would buy at Joann Fabrics years ago, and I'm talking like 15 years ago. And I'd get it at Joann's by the yard and a four ounce, and it would say it on the bolt. It would say four ounce or five ounce denim. So the four ounce denim I would use as backing for my beach quilts and picnic quilts. So that's an awesome, awesome um, option for backing fabrics for those that maybe have never considered it. But this stretch denim, you can see it's real fabric to make real jeans. It's not like a cotton stretch that looks like denim. Okay. And if you look here, I went ahead and stitched, this is six layers of this denim and I stitched it on this machine. So I cut another piece. You don't have to believe me. We're going to stitch it here together today. Let me zoom into where I'm stitching at. And again, I'm using just a universal size 80, 12. You would want to have like a 9014 denim needle in here if you were stitching up an actual project. But I just want to show you motor wise and power wise, you'll see what this machine can do. So we have one layer. I'm going to fold it in half. All right. And I'm just going to leave the stitch length at something that would be between two to 2.5 millimeter stitch length, which would be like a construction seam. Okay. I'm not going to go super long, but once you start adding more and more labels or excuse me, more and more layers to it, you do want to lengthen your, your straight stitch. And that's going to apply across the board. Y'all have heard me say that before when you're stitching seams and you're adding more layers, lengthen that stitch length to allow the machine to pull it through. Okay. So this is just two layers of denim. And again, this machine, we sell it for $399.99 right now in, in our online shop at craftygemini.com. And I know machines that are easy, $3,500, and they can't do what this machine can do. That's why, you know, I always sell only stuff that I recommend, so y'all know. And I have over 40 sewing machines and have taught for 15 years, so I've, I've gone through all the makes and models and brands, okay? So that's two layers. I just want to show you the stitch quality on it as well. And that's a teensy stitch. That's 2.4 millimeters in stitch length, okay? But I feel like with that light colored thread, you can see those stitches really well, okay? So now let's fold it again, and I'm going to double it up, okay? So that was two layers. Now if I go like this, it's going to be four layers, right? One, two, three, and four. And I always start off stitching a little at the regular stitch length that I had. If I see that the machine kind of stops or doesn't want to push through, then I will stop and stretch out the straight stitch a little bit more. So four layers of denim. I mean, I don't even have to. <laughs> and you don't hear weird sounds. It's not clanking around. Nothing. Okay. So there you go. Uh, somebody was asking a question here about this table about whether or not the extension table would be the same as what comes with the HZL F600, and it's not. Thank you. I think Tamara answered that, or somebody did. That 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 extension table is only for, or at least the one that we sell is only for the Juki LB5020 and the Juki LB5100, which is like a step up from this one. I think it just has more decorative stitches. Okay, so, boom. This is the one that went through four layers of denim, okay? So now I'm going to um, keep flipping it. I'm going to add another, let's see, do I have enough here to add it? So if I fold it over like this, I'm only adding one more layer down here to the bottom because I don't quite have enough on this fabric, okay? So this would be one, two, three, four, five layers of denim. 
and I'm gonna lengthen it a little to 2.6. Let's see if we get hung up or not. We can lengthen it a little bit more. But of course, if you were doing some top stitching on the outside of something that had, I don't know why, but for some reason, five layers of denim, then you would probably wanna lengthen your stitch length to about three millimeter stitch length. So this again is an 8012 universal needle and it's having zero problems through five layers of denim, okay? So if that doesn't tell you right there what this machine can do, and look at the stitch quality still, okay? I think that gives you kind of a really good idea of what you can stitch through with this machine, especially because it's denim. So five layers of denim, and on this one I had more, so I stitched six. I think this was six, five or six. Yeah, I think I wrapped it twice, six. So you know what, actually, let's try one more. If I break my needle, That'll be the end of the test, but I don't think it will. This, okay, so if this is five, if we add one more layer under, that'll be six. If I stitch through all of this stuff. And see, anybody else would be a little bit hesitant, right, to like, okay, you're on live camera, see if what, what happens. But I know that the machine can stitch it, so I, I have no problem. I've made foam bags with vinyl, faux leather, cork fabric on this thing and I can stitch it all up, so it's no problem for me. Okay, so six layers of denim on this little work machine. And like I said, I know machines that are upwards of $2,000, $3,000 that can't do that. So like when I say it's a workhorse, it's because I've put it to the test, okay? So hopefully, Nancy, that helps you see a little bit more about of uh, just an idea of what you can stitch on this machine. It does straight stitch, it does zigzag stitch. I have three different videos on YouTube here where I've done a review, an unboxing, and I teach you how to thread it and wind a bobbin. So if you're a beginner or you're thinking about buying this from us so you can gift it to somebody who's starting off, then definitely check out those videos. All you gotta do is in youtube.com, type in Crafty Gemini Juki LB5020, and the videos that I have for it will pop right up. And then it has some decorative stitches. So you can do buttonholes and just, you know, just enough. That's why I always say it's a great travel machine because if you have a fancier, more expensive and heavier machine, you're not always gonna be able to tote that to a retreat or to a class, but you can take this and know that it's still gonna get the work done. And you're not gonna sit there the whole time thinking, oh, I wish I had my machine from home, right? All right, <clears throat> let me grab a sip of water. Yes, awesome. Y'all know I love my Jukies, and Juki does not pay me, but I've been using them long enough that these are the machines that I go to again and again, okay. Oh yes, Sally says, me too. I fly with my LB5020. She says she puts it in the overhead compartment. Love it. That's awesome. <clears throat> okay, so that's the denim question and a little bit more about that machine. We do have a couple more of these machines in stock. So again, check them out at craftygemini.com slash shop. And then I think we have a sub menu for machines and accessories and you'll find it right there. All right, next question is from Lori. And Lori says, my sewing foot allows the needle to be moved from side to side like a standard foot, but it's missing one side. So I'm, I'm thinking that's her, um, her zipper foot, okay? Which results in a lot of guessing when I stitch zippers. So can you tell me the width from the edge of your foot to the needle or the distance from the zipper I should be stitching? Okay, so this is going to vary. Great question, but it's going to vary. And this is why it's important to know seam allowances that your patterns or your projects are calling for based on what the designer intended it to be, based on the instructions, based on the supplies, okay? Because oftentimes you'll see a bag project, let's say, and I'm saying bags because, you know, we're talking about zippers, so we usually put, you know, install zippers in little pouches or purses and bags. And so here I have two different zippers for you to see. And this bottom one here, the pink one, is a number three craft zipper. This is what they're called. They're categorized by the width of the tape, the zipper tape, and the size of the teeth. So you'll see like number three is like the most affordable most of the time. It's what we just call a craft zipper. Like if you have a little zipper pouch and calls for a zipper, this is what you're more likely to go to, okay? The next one here is a size five. It's a number five. You'll see like a hashtag sign five, number, the old school number signs, y'all. We say hashtags these days, but number. The number sign in five handbag zipper. So if we look at the difference between the width of the zipper tape on the pink one and the purple one, you can see that the purple one is wider. This is about an inch, this is about an inch and a quarter, okay? Now the zipper teeth here are also larger, as well as the zipper pull and the handle, okay? So depending on the project that you are working on, 
The designer usually in the instructions will tell you the distance in to stitch when you're stitching fabric to either side of the zipper tape, okay? When I teach, you'll hear me say, sew a scant seam allowance with your zipper foot, meaning split the difference when I have the zipper foot on my machine, and I'll grab it here so y'all can see what mine looks like. <clears throat> okay? I usually install my zipper so that the needle is on the left side, okay? So under here, there's a little bit of a groove, and I put that over top of my zipper teeth, and that's what keeps everything level so that you don't have any kind of clunking around with the stitches or the needle going on the tape, and then, <clears throat> excuse me, potentially on the teeth. If it's gliding right along there, the needle will hit right here, okay? But aligning it like this means that I'm using the full seam allowance of the zipper foot. So usually if I'm sewing, say, a zipper pouch and it calls for exterior and lining fabric, if you've been in my bag clubs and my classes, you know that I usually have you stitch the exterior side of the project to the zipper with a narrow zipper foot seam allowance first. And what that means, notice I scooted this over. So I don't ride the right side edge of my zipper with the right side edge of my zipper foot. Instead, I ride it more close to the middle. And all that does is it takes my needle from going right next to the zipper teeth to slightly over, okay? Now the reason I do that is because then we have another seam that we gotta sew right there as well, and that's to attach the lining. If we sew both the exterior and the lining fabrics with the full width of the zipper foot, okay? you run the risk where on the outside of the project, maybe you went a little closer to the zipper teeth on the exterior, and then you end up seeing your stitches. So I stitch the exterior seam narrower, and then the final construction seam, when I attach that lining, then I know that full zipper edge is concealed, right, with two fabrics, exterior on one side, lining on the other, then whatever that last seam is, I scoot it all the way over so that I'm following the edge of my presser foot. And now for me, the edge of my presser foot from where the needle is here to here is a quarter of an inch, okay? So in terms of Lori's question, what is the, the distance? For me, it's a quarter of an inch, but it depends on the design. If you're trying to follow the, the pattern designer's instructions to the T or how you want it to look. So I'll give you an example. If I don't want any of this pink zipper tape to show, I'm gonna sew that full, full seam allowance. That needle's gonna be right to the right side edge of the zipper teeth, and you're not gonna really have any pink of the tape part showing in the finished seam. You will see pink, obviously, on the little bits of the teeth because it's a pink zipper that you selected, but you won't see any zipper tape. However, if I wanted some of this pink tape to show in the finished project, I could sew both of my seam allowances scant, meaning my stitches will be more like here and I'll have about an eighth of an inch of the zipper tape showing in the finished project. Does that make sense? So I have a couple of my little zipper pouches here that I pulled just to give you a little bit of a visual. This is not great because it's black, but there's a little bit of the black zipper tape showing here. So I see more black because I have the teeth and then a little bit of the zipper tape on each side. On this one, you can see that I use the white zipper here, okay? And it's close to the edge, but I can still see just a little bit of the white zipper tape, okay? I usually don't sew anything super, super close to the teeth because if I'm working with a fabric that's a little bit thicker, say a faux vinyl, a cork fabric, a soft vinyl, pleather, anything like that, if it's too bulky and you stitch super close to the teeth, when you go to press it out, that bulk can sometimes hinder you from smoothly opening that zipper. So I tend to leave just a little, okay? Now on this one here, you can see this one is a little bit closer. There's barely any pink showing of the zipper tape. All you really see here is the zipper teeth and it matches to the lining fabric. So pink on pink, okay? So think about that. Now, the same thing applies if you were using the larger 4.5, they're called number 4.5 or number five handbag zippers. You'll find them depending on the size of the teeth and, and the width here. If I use the same machine with the same zipper foot, but instead I'm stitching on a wider tape of a zipper, look what happens. If I scoot this all the way over the same way I did here so that the groove underneath my zipper foot is riding on top of the zipper, uh, the zipper teeth there, Okay, on here, look how far over it is from the edge of my zipper foot. 
And that's because the width of the tape on this larger handbag zipper is bigger, right? So I don't necessarily want to stitch right here, although you could. Sometimes I get students who ask, hey, in that project you used a number three craft zipper. I have a bunch of these number fives. Can I use it? Yes. If you don't want a lot of this tape to show, because again, the tape is wider on the bigger zippers than it is on this one. If you don't want any of this to show, then yeah, you're going to have to stitch super close so that nobody will be able to know and you won't see the excess tape if you don't want it there. However, if you do want some of that width for two reasons, one, sometimes you want to show the pop of color from the zipper tape, or two, sometimes it's a project where you're like, I wish I had a little bit more room in that area where the zipper opens. You could take advantage of the added width that the zipper tape has and stitch closer to the outer edge. That will give you more of this inside zipper tape to show. And again, it's giving you added room in whatever that area is that you're adding the zipper to. So it doesn't really apply too much when it's a flat zipper like this, but when it's a zipper that kind of opens like this, having any added width is going to give you a little bit more room to open and fit more stuff in. So that's really the only two reasons that I usually will adapt my stitching for the bigger handbag zippers. Okay. So yeah, you can substitute these bigger ones for in, in projects for this. Just keep in mind of the width and how much of that zipper tape you want to show. So a quarter of an inch is usually what you end up seeing with the zipper uh, feet, at least on the basic home domestic sewing machines that I have, is always like this. But if you want to get closer or further away for any of the reasons that I just mentioned that you might, then you just scoot your needle over this way or a little over that way in order to make it work. And when you kind of audition that needle where you sink it down, see if that's where you want it to land and where you want your stitches to be, and then you can go for it from there. Okay. Great. Oh, thank you, Zena. Zena says, good tips. Awesome. Glad to help. All right. Let me make sure I didn't miss anything up here. Oh, great. Nancy Solomon is on. She's the one that asked about the machine. Thank you. Oh, great. She says, I'll be ordering the Juki and you won't be disappointed, Nancy. So that's awesome. All right. Any other questions? No, I thought you were going to say something. Okay. So that's that with the zipper. Now, one thing I will mention because, uh, let me see, because Lori mentioned here about moving the needle over, right? Please be careful because remember, we've talked about this several times on here before with the sewing machine, when you remove your regular zipper or your regular universal foot, okay, and you install a zipper foot on your machine, whether it's on the left or the right, make sure that your needle is in the default position, which usually eh, it depends on the machine. Some machines, the needle defaults to the far left. This one defaults to smack dab in the center, okay? So if instead of like turning on my machine to put on my zipper foot, I was already sewing something with my regular universal foot and I maybe moved my needle over because I was doing some top stitching really close to a top edge or something, always remember to set that needle back to the default position because I'm going to show you on this one. I've talked about this before, but I always like to mention it because people always forget. So what did I do last time? I put a white piece of paper behind here. Hold on. Because I want y'all to see if you have a sewing machine that you can um, move the needle, that you can move the needle left or right, okay? I don't want to break this, but like this. Okay. So I'm going to change my settings on my machine. There's the needle. I just want you to see the needle. When I move the settings on the stitch width and I have selected a straight stitch, I'm going to, you're going to hear the little beep and I'm going to press these buttons up and down. You're going to see that needle move. Do you see how that needle is moving to the left? So now it's at the furthest left that it can go. Now I'm going to go up and you're going to see the needle bump itself, you know, like bump by bump all the way to the right. So you see how that needle is moving and it's going to go until it can't go anymore. Okay. So my range on my machine on the Juki goes from zero, like position zero all the way to the left and position seven, which is all the way to the right. Okay. So what happens if you've been messing around with the needle position on a straight stitch and you go in and install a zipper foot. Okay. Like I have here and I'm all the way to the right position. I'm going to turn the hand wheel and boom, I've hit my zipper foot. Whereas if you don't do it softly, like I'm just demonstrating here for y'all with the hand wheel, if you just press the foot pedal and stitch, that needle is going to instantly break and you're going to have chunks of it flying. So make sure every single time you install your zipper foot that that needle is going to come down in an area of clearance, right? And not in the center of the zipper foot because it's a specialty foot. 
So do that with every one of your specialty feet. And I'm going to move this back because the center position for me is 3.5. And you can always just stop and turn the hand wheel towards you. Here's the hand wheel. You know, you can manually take a stitch like that. So if I turn the hand wheel down and I see, okay, boom, I have full clearance. Then you know that you're clear to actually use the foot pedal to stitch. Okay. But otherwise don't, don't do it. Don't do it. It's very scary when you're just like, Oh my gosh, what happened? And it's like, Oh, <laughs> I know what happened. I forgot. <laughs> All right. Let's see. Okay, good. So that was the second question. Now, the third question is from Jay, and Jay says, as a non-quilter who likes the look of quilted bags, is batting necessary for quilting, or can I quilt some bags that only have interfacing, such as SF-101, since that is thinner than batting? I'm thinking of trying the quilted look on some bags from, like, the mini bag clubs, but I'm not sure if thickness matters for the look or texture of the quilting. Thanks. So this is a great, great question. I love when we get non-quilters who are thinking about quilting. <laughs> All right, so let me put this stuff back because if I don't, I will never find it after this live show, y'all. Regular foot on, zipper foot off to the side, zippers out, and my samples are in. Okay, so this is a great question because if you're a quilter, you know that when we quilt a quilt, right, the word quilting, and I always explain this to beginners and kids and stuff, quilting is the art of making quilts right? But when we already know we're talking about quilting, quilting means stitching through your quilt sandwich, right? The three layers, what makes up your quilt top, the batting or whatever fluff you've put in the middle to add it for added warmth and, you know, texture and, and weight and all that. And then the backing fabric that goes behind it. So that's the quilting part of quilting. Okay. So the word means two things. Now for non quilters who like the quilted look like this, my Sunday tote. Y'all remember? I'm still obsessed. It's still my purse, my everyday purse. This is called uh, my Sunday tote bag, and it's an online PDF pattern and step-by-step -step video course that I offer. And this is quilted, but it's not quilted with cotton fabrics, right? This is the soft vinyl, which by the way, we've restocked all the colors. Go get it now. Uh, but don't leave the live yet. You can go purchase it after. Now, the quilting here the way that you see the texture and the puffiness, you see how it's created all these looks? This is just straight line stitching, and I used foam interfacing instead of batting. This is foam. We sell the Bozal inner form, the sew-in version. It's thicker, but it really compresses down when you stitch through it, so we'll do a little sample of that in a minute. But I have made three samples here for to help answer Jay's question about quilting to get the quilted look, but through different battings or different other, you know, common bag interfacings like SF-101. She mentioned that's the Pellon version of a cotton woven fusible interfacing. We carry the Bozal Fashion Fuse, so that's what I had on hand and that's what I quilted this through. So, and I use yellow on purpose. You're probably thinking I can't see anything. Well, that's the point because I want you to see the texture or the non-texture that's created. So this is a piece of just 100% cotton fabric in a solid yellow and I fused a piece of Bozal Fashion Fuse which is cotton woven fusible interfacing. If you make bags, you know that oftentimes this will be called for to fuse to the exterior fabrics if it's a really lightweight little pouch or you know a nice slim silhouette wallet or something. But oftentimes you see it called for to attach it to the lining pieces so you have kind of a crisper lining inside of your handbags. Well, I went ahead and took the cotton fabric, fused it to it, and then I just stitched diagonal lines an inch and a half apart, just like I did on my bag here. And you can see, of course, I mean, the fabric, of course, is different, but you can see the cross hatching is the same, but there's no texture created because there is no bulk to the interfacing. It's just flat. Okay? So there's nothing going on there. So if you like the quilted look, Jay, if you're watching or you're watching this later, if you like the quilted look just for the lines, that's cool, right? Instead of just using a gray thread, which I used here, you could use a variegated thread on a solid fabric and that would help the lines pop. But if you say you like the quilted look for the texture that it creates, something that looks more like this, then you're gonna need something different, something heftier that has more loft to it, okay? So I went ahead and did the same thing, still an inch and a half apart lines, and I want you to look at the texture that's created in these two. Can anybody tell me which one has more loft and has more texture to it? 
the sample on the left or the one on the right. And you can see just how neutral the thread is on the fabric, but the texture that is created is what pops because the spacing of the fabric and whatever the interfacing or batting is behind it has air in it. It has that loftiness to it. And so where the stitches are, it squishes them down. And so it allows the areas where the stitching is not present to puff. Okay. And so that's what we say about creating the texture. All right. Oh, awesome. Thank you, Susie. She says, I love Whip Wednesdays. I learned so much. How are you learning more, girl? You're like a pro. Okay. Uh, <laughs> yes. Yeah, so you see now I'm seeing y'all's comments saying the one on the right, and you're exactly right. So the one on the left is a batting, but it's a fusible batting that is a synthetic. It's a polyester batting. This is the Bozo Light Fusible Batting, which I absolutely love for a lot of my small pouch projects and even lightweight bags. But because it's a polyester and it's fusible, you know what happens, right? We got to hit it with an iron to make the adhesive melt. So it's flattening it out, right? I'm pushing down with the iron and the heat to melt the glue. So it's really getting rid of any loftiness that would be in this product because I'm flattening it out and adding heat, okay? Now, it also is a super light batting. And y'all have seen me, if you've been in my bag clubs and you do my projects and stuff, you've seen me show this before, the light fusible batting. You see how sheer it is? You can see my fingers through it. Now we carry this in our online shop, but it's tricky for students to figure out which interfacing or stabilizer is the right one to use for what project. And so when I teach and I do my online clubs and my digital courses, I always tell you which one I'm using and why. I'll oftentimes even make the bags in two different interfacings to show you, hey, if you want yours to look like this, use this. If you want yours to have more structure and body, then use that. Because unless you actually use these products, you're not really going to have a good grasp on what works in what situations. Okay. So I like to teach my students all that stuff so that you're better, you know, prepared when you go to design your own project and you think, okay, I need a, a bag for the gym, but I want it to be floppy so I can stick it in a backpack or something. Then, you know, you're probably not going to be using foam. Okay. Cause yes, it'll compress down, but it still has a lot of body to it. All right. So anyways, light fusible batting that was fused and it's barely anything. It is a little fuzzy. There is a little bit of, you know, something there, but it's nothing like this. Okay. So this is the one, if y'all said the one on the right, which I'm seeing a bunch of you said, yep, the one on the right, this one, you can see how the grid pops up, right? It's more similar to here. Like you can see it, the lines and the stitching and in between those st intersecting lines, I get that little puffiness, that body that we love, especially when you wash a quilt after it's been quilted, you know, that kind of loved in feel that it has. And this is a hundred percent cotton quilt batting. It's not a fusible product. It's a natural fiber. I didn't use any spray adhesive. I didn't use any glue. I literally just put the fabric on top of the batting and then I um, drew out my line. Well, not drew out my lines, but I scored my lines with a hair marker. Okay. And that's how I got that texture. So hopefully that visually helps answer that question. If you're going for the quilted look in a bag project, don't go with something flat. If you're wanting that puffiness and that texture that's created by the quilting, go with a loftier product. There are some fusible fleeces, and I will say, because I don't want y'all to get confused here, this I said was a fusible batting and it was a synthetic, but it's also very lightweight, so it didn't quite give me the texture that I was looking for. But there are some fusible fleeces that are still synthetic and fusible, but they're loftier, they're puffier, and so those would work better to help you achieve similar results that the quilt batting did. Okay. It's all going to depend on the puffiness and the loft of the batting that you're using. Okay. Yes. Susie says that's why we need everything in our stash. Absolutely. And that's why I'm able to just like open here. I'm like, Oh yeah, I have this. I have that. I have this. <laughs> you got to play around with the stuff. Y'all a pack of each thing, make a few different projects. And then you start, you know, figuring out what do you like better? What do you like for specific projects and things like that? All right, let's see. Deborah says, would a heavier thread help get the quilted look? So that's a, a good um, kind of a, a suggestion. A heavier thread could help make it puff up more, but still you would need it in combination with the puffy loft because a, th um, a thicker thread and say like a tighter stitch length and a tighter tension, you're going to be cinching down in the areas where the stitches are a little bit more, but you're still going to need something to puff up in the areas that are unstitched. Okay. So I would still make sure no matter the thread that you have something with some puffiness and loft behind there. 
All right. So now Nancy's asking, when are you making the lines? Do you, oh, when you're making the lines, do you start from the end or the middle? Well, let me show you. So the last thing I wanted to show was quilting on the soft vinyl, because a lot of you had asked, and I don't think I got to this last week about how I do these straight lines of stitching through the soft vinyl. So first the soft vinyl, we have it back in stock. I don't have all the colors here, y'all, but I just wanted to go through some of them and show you a couple of the new colors that we got in. We added gunmetal, which is this one, and I'll show you the difference between that and black. Slight difference, but you can see this has more of a, 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 a silvery tone to it. And this is the black where I feel like the picture online of the black looks more like this, but it is black is really black. Okay, so we have all these colors in stock. This is gunmetal. Then we have two different sea foams for those of you that like this kind of minty bluish color. The sea foam original is this one, the lighter one, more minty, but still has that kind of rainbow vibe to it. And then the new one that we added yesterday is I'm calling it the darker sea foam, just so you can sell it, just so you can tell it's just bolder, brighter, darker version of this with more of that rainbow. Uh, coloring to it. Okay. We have the gunmetal. We have, this is cotton candy. I know a lot of you were waiting for that. So that's back in stock, which is like a pink with the rainbow, the pink nebula, super popular. I've showed y'all several pouches made with this one, pink nebula. We got deep space. Deep space is the fabric is the soft vinyl color that I used for this bag. This is it. And it's so wild, huh? How it looks so different when it's quilted. <laughs> Look at that but it's this one. All right. So let's take a chunk and I'm going to show you which color do I want to grab? Let's do purple. Why not? I'm going to grab a chunk of purple. And let's grab our foam. Now the same way that I've quilted this to, or that I quilted it here to foam, you can also quilt it through batting. Okay. But again, the foam is going to allow that vinyl to like puff up in between the areas that are unstitched. Okay. So if I needed to do this, remember that this soft vinyl is washable, cold, and you can dry it also on cool. Okay. You can iron this from the back also because it is fabric backed. Do not hit the front side with an iron unless you have a piece of cotton fabric or a press sheet or something on top to serve as a buffer because this is a metallic finish on top that you don't want to ruin. All right, let's kickstart my iron here because those creases are bothering me and I am going to have to press it just a hair. I can mist it from the back side too with a little bit of water. I love this little mister bottle. We do have these guys in stock too. It's just barely anything. It's not like a stream, like a, like a regular spray. It's just a misting one. And I always have this iron set to the hottest setting. So I don't really want to do that. I want to have it to like a low to medium, you know, and just give it a little press on the back. Dry up the water. Oh, that's awesome. Susie says, taking a cotton candy pouch to my granddaughter tonight for her 11th birthday. Oh, that's going to look so good. If you use the cotton candy vinyl, how cute. Really great gift. All right. Becky says that you tried to order the black yesterday, but it wouldn't let you. That's because it was restocked today. So yesterday was sold out. If you ever are on our site and you're trying to purchase something and say it's something that you're going to select from a drop down menu, if it's grayed out, that means it's sold out. Okay. It's just depending on the settings of the product page, whether or not it will actually say sold out or not. Okay. I think that's good. Cute, much better. So you do want to start off with something flat because it's going to be flat on my uh, foam here. Then I'm going to share with you my favorite way. This kind of stuff, when it has like a slick finish like this or a metallic finish, you're not really going to be writing on it with one of those fabric markers or a chalk pen or anything like that. So what I recommend is a Hera marker. And we actually have a few more of these left in stock, but um, we have another order on the way. So it's a little, it's called like a three piece finger pressing set or something, but it has multiple tools that comes with it that I love. This pointy end I use as a stiletto. So if I'm making bags or I'm sewing stuff like this or binding or stitching with zippers, instead of trying to put your finger as you're 
pushing a little tight corner into the sewing machine, I just use the pointed end of this, okay? Then on the back end, it has a little hair marker end to it. However, it also has another larger one. So basically for me, I use both of these interchangeably depending on how thick the project that I'm trying to mark the lines through is and where the lines are at. But you see these kind of two blades here. It's not really a blade. It's just tapered plastic, but it allows us to get in here and score the fabric so that we mark it enough so that we can see it at the sewing machine for stitching, but it doesn't leave anything behind. Okay. And then you have this other one that's like for pressing the seams open. You put your finger in this little dent and you press that open. But I love to have this. We had them in the kit last year, I think or the year before for the Clammy Quilt Club, and they were just a huge hit. I really, really like it. So either one of these two from that kit, okay? And then what I do is grab my ruler. <clears throat> Let me grab a longer one. This is where these strip rulers really come in handy because you can span the whole chunk. You know, if you're making a larger panel for a bigger bag, then you're going to need something that's going to span the full width. But I will pick an angle. I don't really care. If it's a square, I just will go on a diagonal like that, okay, for drawing my lines. Let me scoot this over. <clears throat> and then whenever I decide, you know, you can choose an angle that you want it to be at. I'm just trying to see here if it doesn't not it doesn't matter to me because it's just kind of a rectangular strip anyways but say I went like this and I started okay 60 degrees see how my ruler has a line right here if you wanted to have them like going a specific angle you can pick a um, a line on your rulers like that too and then just start doing your lines so let's say 60 degrees so I take the end here of the hair marker and I'm just pushing into it like that and you can see the line, okay? So then from that line, and you can press down really hard if you want to. I, with the metallic stuff, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> with the metallic stuff, <clears throat> I don't like to press down super duper hard either because <clears throat> I may run the risk of like lifting up the little bit of metallic finish on it. But if it's cotton fabric, I mean, you can swipe it across there like you would a butter knife. If you did cards or were into scrapbooking and stuff, and um, you have those scoring tools and stuff like that, then you know about this. But it's the same idea. You would score the line next to the ruler. All right. So you would just press down in there, draw your line. Then if I want them the same distance apart, I would position whatever the measurement is on my ruler on the line that I just drew. So for me on these ones, like on this, I did one and a half inches apart. A quick note about this. If you want these little diamonds to be closer together, you're gonna do the lines closer together, okay? Keep in mind, the more lines you do, the more stitching you have to do, the longer it's gonna take you just to get to the point of having the panel quilted, okay? So just remember that. If you just wanna like quilt it and move on, you could even consider doing two inches apart and doing the lines because then you have to go back and go the other way. So although it is just straight line quilting, it's called cross hatching because you have to come in with another series of perpendicular lines to the first ones that you did. So if I position one and a half on the line that I just scored, I can go in, score the next one, smooth everything out, position the next one and a half on that line. And it's funny because on camera, you're just like, there's no way she can see those lines. It's tricky for anybody else to see, but when you're there, you can see the line. So that's what I really like because I don't have chalk. I don't have to mark something with a marker that then is not going to come off later. I can see it, all these lines. And I just score back and forth, running it just along the side edge of the machine. And then I can go to my sewing machine and stitch. So the way that I do it is I usually will do all my lines and keep everything still smoothed out since it's not glued or anything, but you can see. Do you see the lines there? When I lift it like that, you can see those three lines, one, two, and three. So especially on the metallic, like this, you can't really tell, but you can see where it's at. So when you're at the sewing machine, you're more easily able to line up that needle in the center needle position and just write it down the middle of this so you get those perfect lines like that, okay? So what I do is I make all the lines in one full direction. I will quilt the whole panel in that direction. Usually I do start off with one of the one of the ones in somewhere in the middle. 
So say I did lines for this whole thing, I would probably start with this one or the one that would be right next to it. And I'd work my way all the way this way. Then I would come back and start with that last one and work my way this way. To, so that as you're stitching, you can constantly be smoothing that fabric to the outside versus starting on one end, okay? And then maybe you flip it and come to the other end. Instead, you're not gonna be able to push excess fabric away to the outsides. You're gonna be bringing it in and then you end up with this bubbling and puckers on the inside. So always start from the center and work your way out, 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 so nothing gets trapped to the inside. Any little bit of movement that you get, if you give it a quick swipe like that, you know that it's released and your fabric is still gonna be flat. Okay, great. All right, uh, let's see. Ellen is asking, does the quilting adjust the dimension of the piece of fabric so that the measurement is off? Yes. Now, that can or cannot happen depending on a few different things. One of them that really affects is how much quilting you're doing. If you're stitching like one line here and one three inches over and just like a few lines, it won't affect as much as if you have half inch increments and then you come back and do that again. The more stitching, the more it's gonna pull it to the inside. So oftentimes you'll see when a pattern calls for uh, quilting a panel, they'll usually have you start off with a slightly bigger size of both the fabric and the foam interfacing or the batting, whatever sta stabilizer the pattern calls for. And then after it's quilted, it will tell you trim it down to this size and this size because now that is the panel size that you're going to use for the remaining construction steps, okay? So yes, it can shrink it. Um, Vicky's asking, does scoring work on, say, thicker vinyl? So I would be careful with some thicker vinyls just so that if you want to press down with the hair marker on it a little bit harder, you don't really want to um, wreck the actual fabric. So we'll try it on this. This is a thicker vinyl, but it's kind of rubbery also, so I don't know that it's going to... I mean, I can feel it doing something. You can see it, but barely. Now, another thing about thicker vinyls is I don't really have an instance where I would score thicker vinyl to quilt it because this has so much body on its own, I personally wouldn't even quilt this to anything. Does that make sense? Like I would just leave it be, I would press it from the back because it has fabric backing similar to the soft vinyl and I would just put it on top of the foam interfacing but I don't really have to stitch through it. But you could, I guess, if you wanted to. On something like this, though, I would probably use chalk because I can barely see it because it is rubbery. So if this, uh, if the end of your hair mark is a little bit too sharp, you might end up, that's what I was saying, like damaging it, like cutting into it just because it's um a little rubbery. This one doesn't, though. But still, I can't see it. Like I made that line earlier and I can't really, oh, I see the beginning of it here, but that's about it. Here I lost it and further up here I don't see any marks. So for something like this, I'd probably use maybe a chalk or a fabric marker. Also because this is a, a rubbery finish. So whereas the fabric markers, they, you, can, you can make the, the, the marking itself disappear from cotton fabric easily with like a little spritz of water. Because this is not really porous like that, I bet you could just mark it and then remove it with like a little damp cloth right off the top. So if I did something like this, for an instance that you're talking about, like if you did want to quilt through a thicker vinyl, I would probably mark it with a fabric marker like this. And then when the project was done, I'd take like a damp microfiber uh, cloth and just like wash it off, you see? <laughs> it disappears with water. So you could spritz it and then just wipe it off. So I think that would be better and that way you're not actually cutting, you know, like scoring into that rubbery texture at the top of the fabric. Okay. Uh, let's see. Uh, Eunice is asking, will this method work on quilting cotton? Also, absolutely. If you were to make, say, the Sunday tote with uh, this quilted exterior, I would do the same thing. I score it, which actually, here's a perfect example. This is how I did all of these. Okay. I scored them the same exact way with my little hair marker, and then I went in and stitched. The only thing is that with the cotton fabric, because it's so lightweight, be careful that you don't drag the fabric. Like sometimes if it's loose, you can get some ripples if you like take the fabric with you. Make sure that it's pinned or that you're using some uh, a temporary spray base or that you've ironed it and smoothed it really, really nice and flat so that when that ruler is on there, you can run through and make your, you know, your score line really nice and crisp. Okay, but yeah, I especially like to use it on cotton fabric, 
okay? Especially the darker fabrics where, you know, a lot of times these blue or purple markers and stuff won't show up on, say, a navy blue or dark fabric. I like to go in and score it because you can't see anything on top of the dark fabrics, but you can definitely see it. When you're right there at your sewing machine, if you have any light, you'll see the crease right there for where you can stitch, okay? So let me, I'm going to cut this one just so it's a smaller size for me to run under the sewing machine. And I just want to show you how I hold it for some straight line quilting. Now, again, if we're talking about this Juki LB5020, y'all know it's a little workhorse. Your home sewing machine may not be able to do this, okay? So just keep that in mind. You might need to put on a walking foot if your sewing machine doesn't like to go, to go through a lot of bulk. I don't have a problem with this machine. Again, I'm also using an 8012 universal sewing machine needle. If your machine gets hung up trying to do this, you may want to bump up to like a 9014 top stitch needle. So, you know, every machine is different. I'm just showing you what I can do on this one since it's what I have right here. All right, so for these quilting lines, I don't like to do really tight stitches. So I set my machine up. The needle is in the center position. So I'm going to guide the scored line right down the center. There's like a little slit in my presser foot. And so I'm going to slide, you know, keep it so that the line goes right through there. And the needle is right there in the center as well. So my stitches will be nice and straight. For the length of the straight stitch, I have mine set to three millimeter stitch length. So it's a little bit longer than a construction stitch. And this is just so that... Um, we're doing some top stitching, plus we're going through a vinyl. It's a soft vinyl, so it's pretty lightweight, but also foam interfacing, okay? So needle down, here's my line, and then I just follow it. And it does have a metallic finish, so you can kind of hear like a little bit of a, like a piercing through that top layer of the fabric. So if you are going to be using a lot of synthetics and different um, textiles, you know, like the like this soft vinyl, but also any faux leather, anything like that, um, make sure that you change out the needle after a couple of those projects, okay? But you can see, look at the texture that you get just with one line of stitching because this is puffing up here and this is puffing up here, right? Right there. So same thing, I started somewhere in the middle, I come all the way down. I'm gonna pick up here and do the next line in the same direction. So remember I said I usually will start somewhere here and work my way this way. That means I'm doing each single line of stitching to the right, and then I'll come back in and do to the left. And I'll show you how I do that in a second. Three millimeters, I can probably bump this up even to 3.5 and get these stitches done quicker. Now notice I'm smoothing out as I go. I don't want to let the fabric come in here and mess with me, right, while I'm stitching, because it's not adhered to the foam in any way. There's no fusible. I didn't spray it. I didn't glue it. So it's just a matter of me keeping it smooth with my hands as the machine stitches. And you don't have to feel like you got to stitch the whole line in one fell swoop, okay? Notice I stop, smooth, keep going. Stitch a few inches, stop, smooth, keep going. So I would do all of these this way, boom, boom, boom. And you see how you can kind of see a little bit of a rippling there? Don't worry about that. Because when we come in and stitch in the opposite direction, all the fabric that's in between the two intersecting lines, it just puffs up. So it's going this way because we're kind of stitching in that direction, but you won't see that in the finished project, like here. Okay? So same thing. Now, if your machine really does not like to sew through bulk and you tried lengthening your stitch length and all that, put on a walking foot, but be careful too, because again, on this finish here, I don't want y'all, and it would depend on the walking foot in the machine and how much chomp your machine is placing down onto the fabric, because if you get a lot of rubbing on this metallic finish, you might start kind of peeling away at it, and I would hate for you to damage this gorgeous vinyl like that. Now, the other thing I wanted to show you was here. Remember, we started here and worked our way up this way. Well, then I would come in here. So let me do a line. I'm going to do a line to the, um, to the other side from the last one that we stitched. And this is just a note. Some people do it this way, some people don't. But I do, especially if it's not a huge, huge panel. So say I did all of these guys and stitched this way. Now I need to come and stitch this line and whatever other ones are missing here. I do not go like this and turn it so that now the bulk of this is on this side and stitch here, 
Why? Because I've just been stitching in that direction. If I stop now and come this direction, I'm going to get a lot more distortion happening in this way. So instead, what I do is if this was a really big piece, I would just roll it and hold it, roll it, roll it however many times and hold it here so that I can still go in and I stitch this one. If I need to stitch here, I still want to stitch in the same direction, even though I'm picking up on the left side of the center, if that makes sense. So that it's always going in the same direction. That's really going to help me when I go back in and do my cross stitching or excuse me, cross hatching and do those uh, intersecting lines because everything is going in one way. If I repeat those steps to do uh, intersecting and perpendicular lines all in one way as well, everything ends up balancing out. So again, I stop, I smooth. Now here, because we've stitched to the right of this, the only way that I can smooth is down and to the left, okay? So that's also important. Once you've stitched, there is no more smoothing in that direction. If the stitches stop it, you know, like that's the edge. Okay. So now we kept it going in the same direction, like that, okay? And then when I go in and do the opposite side, so the, uh, the lines in the opposite direction, it will all balance out. But let me see. Uh, Susie says, I change sewing direction each line. Is that unnecessary? Yeah, I wouldn't. I mean, it kind of takes up a little bit more time. I see. Are you trying to do that like to kind of balance them out each one? I feel like if I just go in the same direction both ways, I end up having better results. Yeah. So try that next time, Susie, and see. You know, it doesn't matter if you're doing it right or wrong as long as you get the results that you want right I'm gonna stitch this one here and this little short one here and then I'm gonna see if I can Ooh, I'm almost out of time but I just want to show y'all one line in the opposite direction so bear with me here so you can visually see this and remember we are carrying this vinyl now this is the so hungry hippie soft vinyl and we restocked it in 13 colors so you can check it out at craftygemini.com slash shop under fabric. They're all listed right there for you. And see how quick I can get this done. If I had scored all my lines ahead of time, you could just go in there and really crank this out, okay? Now, I'm gonna go in and do a line the other way just to show you how some of this stuff that you're seeing there kind of cancels itself out. We may not be able to see it with just one or two lines, but we shall try. Um... Where's my 60? This way. Boom, boom, boom. Okay. Let me just, I'm trying to match the angles. You see what happens when I pick an angle to start? Now I need to go with 60 degrees the whole time. Okay, well, we'll go here. Since this one runs through all the lines. Okay. And then I'm going to do another one, one and a half inch over from there, I think. That will be enough to show you all. But see, the scoring of this with the harem marker, you would do this the whole way. I would do all in one direction for one full length of the panel and then go in and do the whole thing again because that way you're saving a lot more time than having to stop and mark and stitch, stop, mark, and stitch. You would just sit there and sew, sew, sew. And I'm just thinking now, all those cross hatching, I, all the cross hatching lines I did for my samples. I hope I'm not running out of bobbin thread. Oh, I got a little left in there. Two more lines, and that'll be it. And so again, you can do these lines closer together, further apart. The more stitching you have, also think about uh, that adding a lot more kind of rigidity to the project because the more thread you introduce to the layers that you're putting together, the stiffer it's going to be. So if you're using a fabric that turns out to be kind of a little bit more flimsy than you anticipated and you're stitching it to foam, then you can always consider. So look at the difference. You see how here, because I haven't done the perpendicular stitching lines yet, you see a little bit of that kind of distorting. Like it's just not really distortion. It's just like bubbling up. So it needs something else to anchor it down. And then look here. Big difference, right? So try that out. Check out the soft vinyl. You can make a ton of stuff with it. This again is my Sunday tote bag. It's a PDF and video course pattern that I offer in my online shop. If anybody's interested, it's a beginner friendly bag and it works out perfectly with the soft vinyl and the foam or with cotton fabric and the foam. You could do the exact same lines and crosshatch stitching here that we've done with this sample, okay? 
All right. Great. Okay, good. Well, thank you, everybody. If you have any questions that you'd like me to consider for a future show, make sure to use the link below. It's a Google document. You can submit your question there. And every week we go through and pick out some questions that we answer or that I answer here on Whip Wednesday. So thanks again, everybody, for tuning in. Enjoy the rest of your week. I hope you find some time to make some cute stuff. And I will see y'all in the next one.